Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over five hundred dollars in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to one dollar per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get ten percent off your order with the code Move at Hyperice dot com. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry. Also available in zero sugar, so grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio. With an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording, upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to Malby on the Spot, your weekly chance on Stanfield Index Pro to hear the wit and the wisdom of your friend and mine, Mr. Jan Malby. So let's welcome him back to your ears and eyes once more. Good evening, Jan. Yeah, good evening, Trevor. I hope you're enjoying things at the moment because uh, that team of ours, eh? They just, they just keep going, don't they? It's, it's a remarkable thing. I was having a little think to myself today about whether that, and it's going to get sneered at a little bit when you say it, um, but whether that was possibly in my top five um, Klopp era performances um, for a number of reasons, because the chips were down, because the the the, uh, the everything seemed to be going against us, because in other times in different eras that the side buckles, there was too there was so much pressure, um, and it just felt like an absolutely huge win. And people will say it's only Luton, but it's not only Luton, it's context, Jan, isn't it? Context is what matters here. A, an entire first team of world-class footballers absent. I don't think, and this is where we'll start, I'm interested in your opinion on this, I don't think Arsenal can suck that up and get on and win and dig out a win from being one down in those circumstances. I don't think City can either. There's something in the whole intangible thing with Klopp and this crowd that make us a bit different in these circumstances. That's why Barcelona happens in Anfield. That's why last night happens in Anfield. I, I, I don't know. What do you think about that? Does that seem like an outrageous opinion to you that if Arsenal and City were to lose seven equivalent players or eight equivalent players, do you, what would be your, that, would they be able to get on with it like we did? Well, I mean, obviously it's, 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 it's almost impossible to be 100% sure whether they could or couldn't. What I'm saying is that in the manner of which we did it, no, I don't think they would be capable of doing that. Uh, so, if you look, I mean, things couldn't have gone any worse. There's rumours leading up to the game. One or two players might be added to the players already out. And then all the players who had injuries or minorities all missed out in the end, didn't they? And then you kind of look and think and scramble to get a starting 11. And then we go 1-0 down and you think, yeah, it's caught up with it. It's going to be one of them nights, isn't it? Uh, we missed chance after chance after chance uh, in the first half. But what I liked about the first half was that 
I thought the tempo and the energy was there. We just lacked mm. a little bit of composers. And, and that's why at half time, I wasn't overly concerned. I thought, no, this is going to happen, isn't it? This just comes back to, and I still meet Liverpool fans who shake their heads and go, I can't believe Jürgen has announced that he was leaving us and he'll, he'll I, I think we've seen already what he's done, hasn't he? It's, it's, it's galvanized everything and everybody. Uh, and I even to the extent where some of the younger players are thinking, we better get in on the act because he's not here for much longer, you know what I mean? And I want a bit of playing for Jurgen Klopp, you know? So it's almost as if everybody is just, everybody's just filling their boots, aren't they? You know what I mean? You, 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 you're given an inch and you take a yard, isn't it? Everybody's just going, I'm going to have a bit of this, this. And now we've got this, so there's a problem or not, isn't it? But we've got another, we've got another three or four of those youngs that they, you think they might just be ready, isn't it? Add that to the positive surprise we've had already this season, you know, with Joe Gomez's consistent form and Kwanzaa, uh, Harvey Elliott, Curtis Jones, uh, Connor Bradley, isn't it? You know, we're going to come to the end of the season and gone, we've almost, discovered a brand new team. We, we've discovered another eight, nine, ten players who just look like they're going to be more than good enough and I'm never one for, for jumping to go with young players, uh, you know, because so much can go wrong, isn't it? I did it with Conor Bradley because I think I just think he's a unique talent. Uh, of the others, we need to see more, isn't it? But the club is excited about them and I think a lot of fans are excited about them already. Here, I'm obviously talking about Clark and McConnell and, and, and Dan's that we saw a little bit of, uh, against Luton is it's, 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 it is incredible, Trevor. Uh, and then I look at the next few fixtures and, 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 and I can see, I can see danger, but I saw danger. Brentford, we never gave him a look in, you know, we never gave him what they wanted. They never got any set pieces. They got one corner in the whole game. We, we, we simply destroyed them, isn't it? And we did the same to Luton. With, with almost a completely different team, is it? It's it, it, it is remarkable, isn't it? It it is. It's difficult to see what's going to derail us. It's uh, the best part about it is you mentioned a few people there. I don't know what you think about this, but if we factor in, it's it, we can't really call Harvey one of ours, but he's been there from very young. Um, but if you factor in Curtis Jones. Um, and Trent as academy products. And then you say, well, the two that you mentioned that jump out at me that I think uh, whether I'm making myself a hostage to fortune or not, I don't care. I think Connor Bradley's there. I'm, I think he's a remarkable talent. Um, we were talking last night on Raw about how he has a sort of Andy Robbo like energy. But he's even calmer. He's a cooler customer in front of goal. I think he's going to score goals is my point. He's getting improvised shots away in the previous game and driving us forward at the start of the second half when we really needed it. And I think actually him being taken off when he was, was actually a real tribute to the guy because it's like, well, we're going to need you for the final. Um, so he's an outrageous talent based on a, a, a tiny, tiny handful of appearances. I, I, feel, I feel confident saying that. I think Quan says, wow is another guy who's just where he needs to be. And, and so you could be looking at a first team for Liverpool um, within a season or two that has, you know, four or five uh, academy youngsters coming through. That's in and of itself a tremendous uh, boost to the club. As you said, we've, we're have we discovering on earth in these, these boys. McConnell as well, just a little bit I've seen of him. He looks to have a lovely calm about him. Uh, people really are high on Bobby Clark. More so than I am, but I, 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 I look forward to seeing loads from him and, and young Dan's as well, as you say. And there are others there too. Obviously, there's Kate Gordon as well. So it's very exciting. But even if you look at the first team that started last night, yeah, the, the, the team that we went with from the start, I'm just going back to my notes here so I don't get it wrong. And so we've got our standing goalkeeper in Queeve and Kelleher. We've got Bradley, who is nominally our standing right back. We've got Kwanzaa, who's a standing centre half, uh, and Gomez, who is theoretically, although he's been our best defender this season, I think, uh, a second string as well alongside Virgin. Then, but that, but that unit, nobody's, nobody's getting upset about that unit. Nobody's getting their heads 
um, battered about that unit because we've got Robbo on the bench and because we know that these are good footballers who will do a good job. And then we go to our midfield with Endo, McAllister, uh, McAllister and Gravenberg. And I think for most of us now, on the basis of current form, that's probably two of our best three anyway. So again, there was nothing really to be too fretful about. People, some people aren't so high in Gravenberg. Some people are excessively high in Gravenberg, but whatever. Um, he was bought, he was bought to be in rotation for the first team and there he is doing it. And then we went with Elliot Gakpo and Diaz. Nobody's idea of our best three, uh, goal getters, considering our best three goal getters were all unavailable. But again, it's not exactly bargain basement. It's not exactly throwing out the kids and the kitchen staff. My point in a long winded way, and I just wanted to make it by mentioning the players is, Jurgen Klopp has built quite the thing here. And you can see with Barcelona's job becoming available, Bayern Munich's job becoming available, there's at least one other one, United. Uh, you can see that Liverpool has probably got the most attractiveness of all of those because of that bunch. Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of what we're talking about now is, is, is young players who's come through the academy. And I was at Anfield around the start of the academy. Uh, and I always remember, I don't know if I ever told this story before, when we when we played Ajax in a pre-season friendly in Germany and we were beaten 5-1. It was the summer of 1994 and it was that Ajax team that went unbeaten all season in the league, 34 games unbeaten and they won the Champions League. And they beat us 5-1 and our chairman, David Morris, was there and we were talking after the game and he went, where do you get all these players from? I said, they're all academy players. He was the Dubois brothers, Clive, and all them, I said, they're all academy players. And he went, how did you do it? I said, well, you know, the academy they probably set up in the, in, in, in the late 50s, early 60s, they've been at it for years. Uh, I said, and what you do is they invent, they invest real money into it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not something they have just to have it and should be able to say, oh, look, we've got an academy. It's something they have because they need it. Um, and he said, yeah, I could never see us being prepared to invest all that. And I always remember when we started the academy, talking to Gerard Hulia, and I went, so now we've got an academy. He went, yes, and he said, but it's going to take 20 years. It'll take 20 years before you see the benefits of the academy now. And we're talking late 90s. At 20 years to that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's going back five years. And then I almost got the sense that when Klopp came and he looked at the academy, he thought the academy had derailed itself a little bit in that we, we were, we were bringing in players from other clubs, giving them big contracts. You know, we were trying to safeguard our future by locking these young players into really big financial contracts. And I, I believe the club made some rulings down at the academy when, listen, there's a top line. We're going to pay these. We want young, hungry players who want to play for us. There we are now, five years later. And it just appears that they're coming out of the woodworks from everywhere, Trevor. And they all look, Trevor. They all look like Liverpool players. Mm. All look like players who are capable of playing at that intensity. It looks like almost, well, it is chaos football to other teams because they can't cope at that intensity. But it looks like even our 17, 18, 19 year old young players are schooled in it. It's what they do every day. You know, they already look comfortable at, at, at that intensity. It's, it's some work. It's 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 some work that's been done, Trevor. I have to say, it's some work that's been done. What do you make about that idea of? Um, and we don't want to be thinking about, it, but we can't not think about it because as we speak, um, Bayern Munich are doing Bayern Munich things where they're steadily trying to unsettle Xabi Alonso, um, putting rumours out that he is their preferred candidate to take over from Tuchel um, and he's being asked questions then at um, press conferences just as they've established a nice little kind of lead at the top of the Bundesliga it's classic stuff and it's not surprising at all and Bayern Munich are sort of notoriously arrogant in the way that they approach things and here's the thing the arrogance is justified because they get what they want they always get what they want to that extent, I think they may have an advantage because they always get what they want. Um, 
And I think some people, too many people are reading in a big romantic arc into the whole Jabby and Liverpool romance that I don't think was as real as that in the actual history that we all saw. I think it's, it's, he's, he's inextricably bound up to Istanbul and people always admired him as a footballer, but I don't know that he necessarily has that massive affection that we, some of our fans seem to have for him. But here's the thing, and this is where I'm going with it. It will be very, very hard to say no to taking over the thing that Klopp has built, especially if this season ends successfully. Um, you would imagine it's going to be a situation that uh, who wouldn't want that job, Jan? Well, the only thing I will... So, yeah, I, I agree with Alonso and in terms of it's not a Steven Gerrard situation, is it? You yeah. know, Alonso came and played for Liverpool for a number of years and there were some happy times, but I also believe there were some very unhappy times uh, with, his, with his relationship with, with Rafa Benitez and everything else. I think in an ideal world, Alonso would like to manage the three clubs he played for, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid and Liverpool. I think all three of them have a massive appeal. And I think... And I could be completely wrong here. But if you look at Erling Haaland and the way that his career... So, OK, when he went to Red Bull Salzburg, nobody knew he was going to explode to that extent and score all those goals. But subsequently, his career has been mapped out, hasn't it? I didn't want to take the next step, which is a German Bundesliga, went to Dortmund, I didn't want to go to the Premier League. And I do believe he wants to go to the Premier League to eventually then finish at Real Madrid. And mm. I'm thinking of, of Alonso. He's in a position now where you're looking at the next big thing for the next 20 years and he's in pole position. You know, he's the only one you would put your money on going, did this guy's going to do it? So he might be giving this a thought and thinking, what do I need, what do I need right now? He's probably going to win the Bundesliga with, with, with Leverkusen. He can then buy into Bayern Munich's way of weakening the opposition because that's what they always do in it. Remember that Labour Christian team who was in the Champions League final in 2003, I think. Uh, Bayern Munich just went and dismantled them. And they could do the same by taking the coach and two or three players. Then it's back in Bayern Munich's uh, backyard to win the German Bundesliga. And Alonso might think that that is an easier job than winning the Premier League with Liverpool at the moment. As good as we are because of Manchester City. You know, so... That would be the big worry for me. But it doesn't surprise me. We knew that Thomas Tucker was on very uh, borrowed time. And I would be amazed as well, Travis, that I know everybody goes, Real Madrid have extended uh, uh, Ancelotti's contract to 2026. Surely they've spoke to Alonso and gone, how do we work this out? If you stay at Leverkusen for another year to the summer of 2025, we might be able to bin off Alonso, uh, sorry, Ancelotti. 12 months before his contact runs out, isn't it? I think all three clubs have spoken to him. It's now a big decision for him to make, isn't it? Uh, but if he wants to continue that, and also what he knows is uh, being a manager in Germany, isn't it? So, so I think Bayern Munich is, is, is right in there. And, and, and rightly so, Bayern Munich is, is, is a big club, isn't it? Uh, possibly nine out of ten other former Liverpool players being in the same position would choose Liverpool. This, this, this guy, as I said before, he might just look at his career and go, this is what I want to do and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, so it will be interesting to see. But I'm with you, Trevor. It seems <laughs> a lot, seems a logical choice, doesn't it? But I don't know. It does, yeah. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing as well, Jan, and I, I will say this, even in the short ter- time that we've known about, um, Jurgen's, um, uh, departure, uh, at the end of this season, it, it feels as if, Shabby has gotten himself closer to that benchmark thing that I was saying that, well, like, I would l- prefer a candidate who has won stuff. So for me, when this started, Amarim was a higher, uh, priority for me because he's a guy who's, who's won things. He's the right profile, all that type of thing. Um, but I mean, winning the Bundesliga against Bayern Munich, as you say, he actually, they actually look like they're probably going to do it. Um, that is remarkable. There's literally, you can't argue with that, you know. Um, but I, our most successful appointments in recent times have been Rafa Benitez, who 
uh, won two um, La Ligas against the run uh, of, of the odds. And Jurgen Klopp, who did, did two leagues in Germany against the, 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 the odds as well. They were proper winners and they brought success and uh, elevated the club to a higher status than it was at before they got there. Um, people quickly forget what Benitez did for Liverpool in terms of making us European uh, royalty again and relevant at the very top of the game. Um, what Klopp's done is probably uh, way further on again than that. Uh, so it just feels as if the candidate... Uh, will have to be a winner and 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 Chappie now looks like he's going to do this remarkable thing it's very very interesting as you say there will be a tug of war there he's making himself by far the most sought after hot property but I won't be upset if we end up with the likes of Amarim instead I don't know I think there's a bit of a drop off to the next candidate myself um but we'll talk about this as it develops just to refocus a little bit in terms of last night and the the win against Luton. Have you noticed, Jan, that we talked about how important it was going to be that this galvanizing effect was what happened as opposed to people starting to feel sorry for themselves or, you know, a big sentimental sort of a thing that ends up in underachievement. Um, and the key to that was going to be what the ground sounds like. And I can tell you the the... I, I was as impressed um, by some of the noise I heard against Chelsea um, a few weeks ago uh, as, 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 as I've ever heard, really. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to be there for the Barcelona night. I think that that must have been pretty special. And you could really you could hear that reverberating through the TV. Even. But people who I work with have told me that last night the ground was absolutely electric. And again, this is one of these, it's it's not even intangible. It's a really important thing. It's going to be part of what pushes us if we manage to do this amazing thing and win this league. Um, That is going to be a huge, huge part of it. Those home games are must wins. And that's what it felt like last night. It was like, no way we don't win here. The the, the crowd felt like they were pushing uh, the team along. And that's fantastic. It's auto show time. Hurry in your local Jeep dealer for great offers on your favorite Jeep brand vehicles. Now while qualified lessees get a low mileage lease on the 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo X4x4 for $429 a month for 39 months with $3,755 due at signing. Tax, title, license extra. No security deposit required. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires dealer contribution and lease through Stellantis Financial. Extra charge for miles over $32,500. Not all customers will qualify. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 229-24. Jeep is a registered trademark. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise, and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. The best I've ever heard Anfield Trevor was uh, semi-final against Chelsea 2005. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, it was it was that start of, of like you said being relevant again, isn't it? Uh, but I totally agree. And I also think that I think when when the opposition comes to Anfield, they have a certain expectation of what it's going to be like in terms of intensity on the pitch and in the stand. And I think the fact that Luton made a big point of mentioning that whole sort of they felt it, didn't they? Mm. They felt that Jesus Christ. Let's yeah. get out of here as quick as we can. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this yeah. is not this is not safe, is it? You know what I mean? Let's <laughs> let's go home, isn't it? You know what I mean? So so yeah, it, it is remarkable, isn't it? You know, and I still have people who go, well, this is such a big thing for Jurgen Klopp to announce that he's leaving, and it will have an effect at some stage. I refuse to believe it. Everybody is bought in on using as a positive, and everybody has bought into being prepared to give everything they've got. You know, now the next game we're looking forward to, Trevor, is the cup final, isn't it? And I'm speaking to people already, isn't it? You know, 
it is only, but it's the first trophy of the season and people are so excited. They're going down. You know, it, it's, we have been a bit blase over the years, Wembley and whatever, isn't it? But this is like, this is like, we spoke to you the week about the players and we feel like the players are almost like soldiers, aren't they? Well, the fans are now also foot soldiers, aren't they? You know, we've got to be there in good time. We've got to be make sure that we're there to do everything we can, isn't it? So, as I said before at the start of the show, Trevor, it's going to take some fucking stuff in this, you know. It's as powerful as that tank that Bob Paisley drove into Rome, uh, you know, the first time around when he was there. And he, and he went back in 1977, isn't it? This is as powerful as Bob's tank, I can guarantee you. <laughs> it has that feeling, yeah. It has that feeling. I mean, we, we, we've been blessed with this, the timing of this show. Um, it's been all good times. I, I, I was watching last night as Jürgen was going one side, the other side, the other side, and doing all the fist bumps. And I'm sure that kills uh, people uh, who are fans of other clubs. I'm sure it just, I'd say it just eats them up. Uh, you know, to see that kind of bond, to see that kind of, it's, it's, it's magic. It's magic to watch. And it should, the connection is so unusual. Um, and it's easy to take the piss out of that, I think, if you're an opposition fan, if we aren't doing well. But this club has been just unbelievable for the last X amount of years under Klopp. Yeah, there were a few fall-offs, whatever. It's very hard to maintain uh, a competitive run against these uh, financial dopers that we're up against. How how can you not have an occasional trailing off? But when you think about how close this club has been to multiple titles that didn't get quite get over the line. But like we're talking last minute stuff, a point in the league, uh, a couple of occasions, uh, a, a, a two Champions League finals kind of one of them at least left behind us a potential for two or three there and two or three leagues. This is why this season feels like it's got huge extra relevance. It's, I think this, Jan, and you can speak to this better than I can, obviously. But I think this is where that kind of sentimentality and emotion that Liverpool is famous for, the connection between fans and manager, the connection between players and fans, all those kind of things, this is where it's going to become relevant. This is where every little ounce of that is going to be required so that it does turn into Bob's tank, so that it does feel a bit like... The opposition teams are shrugging and going, oh, fuck this. I would, yeah, that's like, you know, we, the, 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 there's no shift in these. I wonder, does it, do you think it's getting that feel yet? Because all of a sudden we have this sneaky point lead now, um, regardless of what anyone does with their games in hand. That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's heading that way, uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, the sort of togetherness. And I also think that feel, it's just important. It's important when you support something, Trevor, that you also believe and feel it, you know. So, you know, I'm lucky in my job. I go to a lot of games and, uh, you know, I tend to cover the big teams and when they go to a, a lesser uh, club uh, and they support their own team without the belief, you know. Liverpool roll into town. They support their own team without that belief, isn't it? But that's not what's happening here, is it? You know, we're supporting something with a belief, you know, and, and, and that belief and that togetherness, it's, uh, yeah. I don't want to say it again, it's a Trevor, but I can't, I, I kind of, I know there's some difficult games before we play City, isn't it? But should we head into the City game having won a trophy through to the next round of the FA Cup? Uh, going to Forest, which will be a difficult away game, and winning there, it, 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 it'll be off the scale. That game will be off the scale. And I think that should we go into that game even with five or six of the top boys missing, I think we'll overcome that with something else that we might be the only club in the country who has, you know, that sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're together and we're just going to, we're just going to mash you together, you know. <laughs> yeah. You won't be able to cope with this, I'm telling you. This you won't be able to go with. It just feels great to hear Anfield capable of eating a team alive again. Uh, and it's very Klopp. It's very Klopp era. 
I love it. Oh, you brought it up. Let's just go there cr- briefly. We'll be talking about the Chelsea game um, towards the end of the show. But obviously that is first out of the blocks on Sunday. Um, but then we have on the Wednesday straight after, we have a another cup uh, fixture. It is at home against Southampton. Um, uh, and that's on Wednesday evening. We go to Forest then. Um, we have a Europa League game then, uh, which I think we're away in the first leg. And then we have, uh, uh, on the Sunday following that Thursday, we have the City game. Now, on paper, regardless of who we draw in the Euro- Europa League, all of those should be winnable fixtures, should be. But I'm wondering now, given the absolute pressure that has come on, um, you know, to be missing uh, Salah, Nunes, Jota, to be missing Thiago, Jones, uh, who else were we missing from midfield last night? Oh my God, my brain's gone. Dominic. Uh, Dominic. Dominic. Uh, and then to be missing, uh, uh, Trent Alexander Arnold, who's just like one of the best in the world from our defensive lineup. Like I say, not many squads can do that. Um, we don't know what the, the rate of their, their return is going to be. I'm always pessimistic because I think Kloppo often gives out optimistic figures for when people will return. Where I'm, get, where I'm going with this, Jan, is does Southampton now all of a sudden have a huge amount less relevance? Is it a game now where you go, listen, things are going really well? Uh, across three fronts. As you say, if we've got a trophy in the bag and we're looking at Forest, a really important away fixture, um, and then a, an away fixture in Europe ahead of City, is Southampton the one now that takes a hit? Is Southampton the one where we really do go in a very, very weakened sort of lineup? And then again, is that even relevant at Anfield these days with these lads that we've got in the squad? I and mean, what does that even look like? I don't know. The, I, I, I'm curious about what you think the priorities will be. Like, is, 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 is sacrificing a competition a thing you think Klopp would even do? No, I don't. Under mm. normal circumstances, he might weigh up things. Uh, but I think he feels that it's going so well. Uh, He's got so many unexpected players too that he can now use. And also think the fact that Klopp is only human, isn't he? And he knows that he's only got a couple of months left, isn't he? So he ain't going to give up anything that's going to give him moments to add to all the moments he's had at Liverpool, isn't it? You know, he's, he spoke about that before, isn't it? You know, Klopp coming from Germany and, and understanding winning the, uh, the, the 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 cup competition in Germany, uh, but 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 we have this Wembley thing, don't we? Uh, I think it's it's took a long time for Germany before they finally settled. They've got to play all the finals in Berlin, but we have this Wembley thing, don't we? Tradition over. It's just a, a massive big thing, isn't it? So so there will of course there will be there will be some changes, but when you look at the game against Luton and with all the players we had out, Jurgen still chose. To leave Konati and Robertson on the bench, isn't it? You know, so I think he's quite easy within what our players are capable of, especially when we're at home, because he's thinking, I'll play this team against Southampton because I believe they're good enough to win, whoever they may be. He said, but I also know that they'll get another 10 or 15% on the crowd. Can you imagine getting beat 2 1 by Southampton with 10 minutes to go? The crowd ain't going to let that happen, are they? You know, so I think he's kind of, you know, it'll, it'll be all right. So sacrifices, no, but he will, he will of course, also with the European game, you know, he, he will, he will have to weigh it up. Uh, but, but he'll still put out a team. And the last thing he'll be telling before they go is we win this, you know, championship team at home. We win this. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it is, it is really, really exciting. And I mean, it's, it's this thing about for a lot of people, it's like city, isn't it? But you've got to get to City, haven't you? You've got to get to City in good form. City are also looking and thinking, we've got to get to Liverpool in good form. But are they? I know they're on a 12-game sort of in it, but you're not overly... Oh, no, sorry, they drew with Chelsea. You're not overly impressed, though, are you? You know, struggle to beat Brentford, 1-1 with Chelsea, isn't it? So 
Whereas we're just going, yeah, yeah, okay, I know City's there, but let's do all the other bits first, isn't it? You know, so, hey ho. <laughs> you imagine, regardless, um, Pep Guardiola would uh, quietly prefer to be in the uh, Carabao Cup final. Um, anyway, so, you know, these these are the kind of things that would be floating around in his head. And the more that we can do to uh, make him ask questions, the better. It seems to be the one thing that has been a real sort of advantage for, for Jürgen over the years um, with the, the, the rivalry with Guardiola and City is that he seems to manage to get Pep to really get inside his own head a lot and sometimes overcomplicate and make some strange decisions with selections and things like that. Uh, and that's what we really have to hope. And the only way, of course, that's going to happen is we keep winning. Um, and I think, again, it would very much upset them where we win four trophies, um, you know, and the, the possibility of that uh, would be something that he'd be dreading as well. So, again... A win against Southampton would help create that extra bit of tension there. It's, it feels like it's such a huge thing. It feels like it's a big ask that every single game we're going to have to rely on this um, emotional response. But I don't think it's just that. I think, like we said, there's been some incredible um, movement forward from some of the players. So I want to have a look at a couple of the players who really, I think, stepped up um, recently. And one who was getting absolute dog's abuse at the start um, and one who I was fearing might not be able for the physicality of the Premier League at the start is Wataru Endo. And to me now, like I said to you maybe 15, 20 minutes ago when we started, that kid's actually now, he is in the first team uh, with two eights ahead of him. My best uh, 11 now would be with Taruendo, with Dom and Alexis and Curtis swapping in for one of those. And that's not to denigrate Curtis Jones, who's been absolutely outrageous, but I just think we really need the profile of player that Endo is. And if it was, listen, if it's Jones and the two lads as well, as the season goes on and we manage to get them back fit, that's good too. But Endo has been so, such a breath of fresh air. The combative side of his game, Jan, has really just gone through the roof. He's constantly getting these foot ins and playing clever little forward passes and um he really a positive impact um on the team lately. He's made himself quite indispensable, I would suggest. Yeah, unexpected I think. Uh you know, I think there was a there was a few eyebrow brows raised when 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 we signed him for Stuttgart and we thought, well this is not quite the profile of players that we normally sign. And then there was Klopp who came out and really built him up, didn't it? You know, we really built it up and said, you know, this is a special player. I've had so many phone calls from Germany congratulating me and saying, wow, you've got a really good player here. And you think, well, okay, yeah, we're going to say that because we didn't end up spending the 100 million uh, that we thought the club was going to, isn't it? Uh, and then we start the season with the boy not playing, Alexi having to play in a six. And you thought, oh, yeah, here we go. He's not good enough. You saw him at Newcastle. That was the first time I, I sort of thought, yeah, okay, there's, we need to work with this guy. You know, the, the, the one thing that frightened him uh, in that game was the intensity and the physicality of, 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 of the game. Uh, but you have to say that just before he went away, uh, with, with, with Japan, he was starting to find his feet. And I think then going away, playing with Japan, uh, and, and playing games. And he's come back uh, really, really good. Super down at Brentford, uh, the other day as well. And, uh, yeah, he's a really, really good player. It's, Football is about many things, Travis, but mainly, mainly, it's about being in the right place, isn't it? If you as a footballer can be in the right place, you save so many things. You know, you save energy, you save uncertainty, you help players around you, isn't it? And I would think that that is his biggest strength, knowing where to be. You know, where do I need to be to support the front three and protect the back four, isn't it? So, yeah. Is, 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 yeah. I mean, we spoke before about, on a, on a Bradley, whatever, isn't it? Maybe, maybe, maybe this guy is the biggest surprise of the season. Can you just elaborate on that for me a little bit? And, and listen, it's, it might be something that's not possible to explain, but it's, it, it's, it'd be silly of me not to ask, seeing as we have a man of your profile here who's played the game to the level that you did. 
when you talk about knowing how to be in the right place, uh, I've asked you a version of this question a couple of times. I, so you probably know what's coming here, but you know, we get new listeners all the time and I just want to try and get, get to the hub of this. My opinion about what you're saying there is uh, that that is a thing that you just, I don't think it's coachable um, in, I don't think it's completely coachable. For me, that is an instinctive kind of thing. Um, it would have been a, a, an aspect of the game that I think you would have had. And when you, you talked about moving back into the fence and understanding um, what you were seeing in front of you and where to be and where to move to and how to anticipate rather than having to react. Uh, these are things that I think some players are actually just sort of born with. More, other players are more reactive um, and not necessarily – like, for example, I'll give you a, a, a really good example. One of my other success stories that we want to get to in a minute is Harvey Elliott. But Harvey can give you the impression of what I call at the start of the year – having toddler energy, you know, he's literally buzzing about the place um, without any necessary clear plan, not quite following the ball, but, you know, it, it not in a disciplined way and certainly not in that kind of instinctive way that we're talking about here that you're saying Endo seems to have. And I know from watching you that that was part of your game. Is it a thing that you can coach that kind of positional awareness or is that something really that just some people have it and others don't? Hello. I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. I do believe that you can coach it to a, to a, a certain extent if, if you play in a team with a very tight structure. And th- mm-hmm. there is teams who play with a very tight structure. We don't do it. We play a very expansive sort of game, isn't it? So it's, it, it, it is almost for the individual to be able to work it out himself. I know Endo is not the same type of player as Steven Gerrard, but let's compare the two of them. Gerard, because of his great recovery, never had that sort of same feel about where do I need to be on the pitch? Because he's thinking if, if I'm over there and I don't need to be there, I can recover to be back to where I need to be. Whereas Endo probably doesn't have the same recovery uh, ability. So he also need, always needs to be in the right position. And the first thing you weigh up is that in that position, Trevor, is, is the team, yeah? Is the team from my position going to be in trouble? That's the first thing you think, isn't it? And then, of course, the second thing is yourself. Is the team going to be in trouble? Am I going to be in trouble? You know, and then and you look around. And people always say is that, is it possible to work all those things out as quick as they get? I said yes to this. It's, it's remarkable how many things that you can, you can work out in, the, in, the, in a split second and go, team is okay, I'm okay, this is where I need to be. This doesn't look right, I need to be here. And often, it isn't about sprinting 40 metres to be in another position. Often it's about stepping two yards that way, three yards that way, dropping back, stepping forward to... to. That was the one thing... When we talk about that, was the one thing that that I think I added to to my awareness of where I need to be when it came to Liverpool was much more of stepping in. You know, whereas I was maybe used to taking a step back, taking a step to the right, taking a step to the left. When it came to Liverpool, he went, no, no, step in. Go forward. Put the opposition on the press. And so, and I and I and I guess Endo coming from the from, from the Bundesliga, which which has a lot of structure and you have a lot of responsibility. Uh, often in Bundesliga, they still almost play man to man, isn't it? So I think he's had to have a look at it and he's worked it out. And he just has a sixth sense. 
it's better for the team and for me if I'm here. And now it's better if I'm there. And sometimes you can play games where you're not much in focus. And that can be a good thing, Trevor, because you shouldn't have all these things that is not happening because of your position. You know, compare that to the guy I used to love talking about when we talk about what, what does this guy shut down with, 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 with uh, his positional play was Alan Hansen. You know, Alan didn't have to do an awful lot. Jamie Carragher always had to do a lot as a defender, yeah? Sliding in, tackling, whatever. Alan never because he persistent. And then there was a bit the same. Sometimes you go, just by standing there, he's stopping things uh, developing, isn't it? So that's that feel of, is the team okay? Am I okay, isn't it? So, yeah, I think it's very impressive. It has been. It has been for sure. I'm just watching the clock here and it's going to get away from us if we don't get to the big game at the weekend. So let's do that. And just so that people understand um, that Chelsea, uh, it, there's been a lot of talk about how Chelsea have had a little bit of a revival of late. Um, they had that draw with City uh, in their last league outing. They had a 3-1 away win at Crystal Palace. They had a 3-1 away win against Villa in the FA Cup. Uh, then previous to that, I think they had been beaten by Wolves um, at Stamford Bridge. I think it was a 4-2 defeat. And then previous to that, we'd beat them 4-1. So I was kind of curious where people were getting this oh, Chelsea are on a bit of a run here. I suppose they've had like two decent wins there and a, a creditable draw. Maybe that's what they mean. So I'm curious to see what you make of them under Pochettino. In the last game, in that one-all draw, they went with uh, Petrovic. They had Colwell and De Sassi, uh as centre-halves and Gusto and Chilwell on the flanks. They had Caicedo and Fernandez. a <laughs> Wow, what an expensive midfield pairing that is. Ahead of them, a trio of Raheem Sterling and Conor Gallagher and Cole Palmer and Jackson up top. Now, it's only when you start looking at Chelsea's bench that you understand uh, over the last few years just how much money has been sunk into that club over the years. For once, that bench wasn't looking as strong as you might expect. Now, they still had Chalaba and Konku, um, Mudrick's on there, Madweke's on there, uh, and then the rest of them are people that I'm not familiar with. Alfie Gilchrist, I, I've, I've not seen play. Samuel Smith, Ali Harrison, uh, Kisadi, who came on as well, I haven't seen him play, or uh, Bettinelli, I think I've seen him play once. So, it, compared to the usual Chelsea squad and depth, it's perhaps not what we may have seen in the past. But that really, as we've just seen with Liverpool, doesn't matter. So what I'm asking you is, do you think with this bunch that we're seeing uh, a sort of a managerial uh, impact here? Are, 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 are we starting to see a style emerge, an identity emerge in the team? If so, what do you think that is? I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. I think it's tricky. You know, I think ever ever since Todd Bowley came in and spent all that money uh, in a couple of transfer windows, I think they've generally been disappointed. Uh, you know, I think it's a fair argument to say that they're underachieving. But I'm not 100% sure they're underachieving as much as people think. Because when you, when you, when you look at the players they purchased 
and you and you, and you go through them and you go, I'm not convinced that he's a top player. I'm not convinced he's a top player. Some of them have got potential, isn't it? Uh, Mauricio Pochettino, which we do believe is a is like a a, a project a, a manager he can come in and he can, but he hasn't. You know, he hasn't done well enough. He needed to do better. So if we go back to the Anfield game and you were there, Trevor, it was embarrassing. You know, four one. How they got away with that, I'll never know. And then you think there must be a reaction. There wasn't a reaction. They got hammered again, four two at home by Wolves. Uh, but then came a game, and it sounds funny when I say this, but that, then came a game that suited them at Villa Park, uh, where they could play on the counter. Uh, what you need to do when you play on the counter is you need to defend well. They didn't do that at Anfield, but they defended well at, at Villa Park. Uh, and on the counter, they really hurt Aston Villa. Then the Crystal Palace game, which is a game that doesn't suit them, because Crystal Palace get men behind the ball and defend. And if you look at the stats from that game, they got lucky. They scored two goals, I think, in, in 90 plus minutes to, to, to win 3 1. But I think for the first half, they had something like 400 odd passes, never had a shot on target. So that's not their game. And then came another game that suits them. As, uh, Manchester City away. You, you need to defend well, and they defended well. And they played, they played through Manchester City's press, and they actually created some really good chances. I felt that. Yes, in the end, when you look at what City did to them for the last 25 minutes, where they absolutely pummeled them. But by then, City could have been two or three down, uh, had Chelsea taken their chances. So what am I thinking? It is all to do with whether they can defend or not. Can they cope with what we throw at them? If they can, it'll be a tight game. If they can, they'll get the opportunity to play through our press with, with end, so with Caicedo, who's getting better, and Conor Gallagher, who I've always liked as a player. And they also, they've got some good options up front. Cole Palmer is a smart player. And Jackson will stretch you because he runs in behind. Uh, but it's all to do with whether, can they cope with... See, they cope, they cope for a long time with Manchester City. Can they cope with us? I, I don't know. I think it's a big ask to cope with us. But if they do, it's going to be a tight game. Yeah, but for, specifically for that reason you, 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 you've outlined, um, I, I was, I was hoping you'd go there. I was going to suggest, is this going to be a game that might, uh, suit Chelsea? Obviously, the, as you said, the Anfield one was an example of them being quite shambolic in terms of, uh, defending and like, as well as you suggested, it, it probably should have been a lot more on the night. But, um, if you just take the overall way that we play, we like to have the ball, we like to uh, keep the tempo up, we like to be on the front foot, it does seem as if that would be like it was against City, a kind of a structure of a game and a team that they, they would be comfortable against uh, on the break. And you've highlighted some of the uh, the incredible footballers that they have. Like Obviously, they, uh, they've underachieved spectacularly, some of these guys. But it's not like they're going to suddenly become bad players. We would just hope it doesn't happen uh, on a big stage uh, in a final uh, where all of a sudden uh, Enzo and Caicedo just uh, emerge as these, uh, well, what what they are, which is wonderful footballers. Um, so we, this is going to be an odd conversation because we can't say who's available. Speaking to you just before the mics went live, you were saying you're hopeful there seems to be at least hope that we might have Salah back in the fold, that we might have maybe Darwin back in the fold. I think Dom's not far off it um, from what we hear. Ali, I think, is going to be the end of the month. I think that's what Klopp said. So <laughs> that's it's a big, a big ask for young Kelleher. And what we do there is just pause real briefly because I want to get your take on him before we finish up that question. Another one of the guys who came in and I think because he had no rhythm uh, was a bit sketchy at the start, but I really feel like he's kind of finding his feet. Made some great saves in the game before last. Um, really unlucky to not have a clean sheet in that game. Really, I thought as well, solid last night. Maybe the kicking was a bit askew. I was really questioning what we were doing hoofing the ball forward so much. Uh, but you know, maybe for if it's a second ball kind of idea, I don't know. Um, what, just briefly on Kelleher, do you think, do you feel a level of confidence in him going into this spell that we're going to need him for until the end of the month? Yeah, I think so. I think 
you know, he's he's obviously a a, a, a a reserve goalkeeper who is not worried about playing. Yeah. Uh, and I always think that's a good sign, isn't it? Because believe me, with the clubs now having three goalkeepers or whatever, you will have goalkeepers who go, as long as I never have to play, I'll be just fine. But this kid looks like he wants to play, isn't it? So he's only going to get better. Isn't it? I'm not overly concerned about him. Uh, I was a little bit at Brentford because he was, you know, he was only his second game back and he played the Burnley game. But Brentford is a totally different experience. But then Brentford only had one corner in the game and they couldn't put him in the time of pressure. And I actually think that was good for him. It, I think it, it would have been a nightmare had Brentford had seven or eight corners and could have been able to put him under a lot of pressure. So he escaped all of that. Um, I have never been concerned about Gallagher. I think he's more than capable. I wouldn't be only concerned about him. But when you talk about injuries, Trevor, so Alisson, hamstring injury, scan, available after the international break, yeah? But I think the other injuries, Nunes and Salah and Dominic or whatever, it's a bit like day by day, you know? Yeah. It's not a massive injury. I've, I've been there myself, Trevor. You know, one day, you can't walk out of the treatment room. And then you come back in the next day and you go, do you know what? Bang. And I think that's kind of day by day with some of them. Some of the others, they're aware that Trent Alexander or whatever, some of them shot, obviously. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be long, isn't it? But I think we've got three or four of them that is literally day by day. And I wouldn't be surprised if Klopp says on the press conference when he does it before the cup final, he will be forced to say, we're very hopeful. They've been on grass, they've done a little bit of work, uh, but we're still not 100% sure. Yeah, Curtis, of course, folding in there into the, the discussion too in terms of the the timetable and his injury. I'm I'm not positive either. I, I, uh, what the latest is on that, but I guess where I'm going with this is, regardless of that, there are some selection issues around that. You you would imagine there will be at least one recruit, one uh, member of our nominal best three strikers um, will be able to come in. Either Mo or Darwin, you would hope, will be available for the final. Um, it's the defence that I'm curious about because we, 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 again, we can't know what the uh, midfielder availability situation is going to be, but we do have, uh, there is a call that he has to make here because like you said, Kanate started on the bench. I would have thought normally he was our second best defender, um, to, uh, to, to be sitting alongside Virgil. Um, he, uh, you had Andy Robbo on the bench and, I would have just thought that Kloppo's loyalty and Robbo's service and record would mean that he would be a kind of an automatic starter. But that's absolutely outrageous on Joe Gomez, who's been brilliant. And can you really drop a kid who's in such incredibly impressive form as Conor Bradley is? Conor Bradley, who drove us uh, forward in the game last night, who was absolutely vital to the extent of having one Connor Bradley being sung about him uh, in that game against Chelsea with a goal and assist. Don't know. I don't know what I think about this, Jan. It, it, it's hard to know what he's going to do with that defence. So, for my money, Bradley plays, Konati plays, and Virgil plays. Uh, and I'm a bit like you, Robbo probably plays. Uh, the one thing that surprised me uh, was the Brentford lineup that I thought Joe Gomez would have played in that game. Mm. Uh, uh, also because of what Brentford brings in, in terms of aerial power and whatever. Uh, but I, I, I think Robbo probably plays a Wembley and he'll be harsh, uh, on Joe. But I think Klopp's had a word and gone, listen, there's going to be plenty of games between now and the end of the season. We're in a situation now where we might not be able to rely on Trent and Robbo playing every single game for 90 minutes. So don't worry. Uh, so I think Robbo plays, uh, as left back, uh, at Wembley. Well, we've got ourselves to that time of the show again where we're looking ahead to two games. Uh, we have our final on Sunday against Chelsea um, at Wembley and then we have that um, FA Cup game against Southampton on Wednesday uh, before we speak again. Um, so, as ever, I'd like to get a take from you on how you think those two go. So, Trevor, I'm not necessarily uh, big on statistics. But if you look at the way we're playing at the moment, we're having generally in excess of 65% possession. We have between 25 and 35 shots per game. We have 10 plus corners in every game. Who can cope with that? You know, and that's why we're having the amount of goals and chance we're having the moment because nobody can, can cope with that, can they? Uh, so that's the first thing that Chelsea have to, Chelsea have to get those numbers down. You know, they have to have more possession. 
They have to stop us having as many efforts as we do, isn't it? Uh, and I actually think they might do that. I, I think Chelsea might be able to get our numbers down. And I also think that we won't be able to create the same intensity at Wembley as we do when we play at Anfield. So I think possibly it'll be a lot more tense than what we expect. And after all, it's a cup final, Trevor, isn't it? Mm. You know, they aren't always as straightforward as you think. So I think we'll win. And I think we'll win in 90 minutes. And I think we'll beat them 2-1. Fantastic. In terms of FA Cup progress against Southampton, where do you reckon that? Yeah, goes? I think we'll beat them. Obviously, Southampton's had a super season and they've got some really good players, there's no doubt about them, but they're the young team. But they'll come to Anfield uh, and I think they'll give it a... So I expect fireworks and I think we'll beat Southampton 4-2. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Well, I hope we get a chance to speak uh, after those two games and ahead of the next two. Um, we will aim at that anyway. But regardless of whether you do or not, uh, for another fantastic chat, Jan. Thanks very much. No problem, Trevor. Looking forward to Wembley on Sunday. I mean, it's a nightmare, isn't it, Wembley? You know, getting there and getting away, isn't it? But I wouldn't miss it for the world. You enjoy yourself, my friend, and I know you're. It's a. I know you're working, but I hope you enjoy it, and hope it's a, a happy occasion for all of us, and we can look back on the first of potentially four trophies when we speak next. So that was Jan Malby. I've been Trent Denny. This is Malby on the spot. We we'll speak to you next week. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement. And we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash Discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, We'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network. If you only have a 401k, you're not getting the most for retirement. Wait, what? Add a Robinhood IRA on top, then they'll boost it by 3%. You can do that? And if you transfer in any retirement account, you get 3% on top of that. Is there a limit to the match? No limit. Robinhood Gold gets you the biggest contribution match of any IRA on the market. Sign up for Robinhood Gold at Robinhood.com slash boost by April 30th. Subscription fees apply. Investing involves risk. 3% match requires gold for one year from first match. Must keep IRA for five years. Match on transfers subject to additional terms and conditions. Robinhood Financial LLC. Member SIPC. When you wake up well-rested on a great mattress, everything becomes clear. Huh, I do make everything about me. Things you missed when you were tired finally reveal themselves. That meeting could have been an email. It's the President's Day sale at Mattress Firm. Save up to $500 on select Tempur-Pedic adjustable mattress sets and get a $300 gift toward pillows and more, all with free and fast delivery. The right mattress matters. We'll find yours. Restrictions apply. See store or website for details.